Well, joining me now is Rachel Smith. You might recognize her name, her face. She was one of the prosecutors on the Lori Vallow Daybell trial uh, a little over a year ago, and she helped assist on the Chad Daybell's case up until a few months before trial. She has a, a very extensive um, history dealing with high profile cases, capital punishment cases and murder cases in general. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for chatting with me today. How does how did you decide to go into this, first of all, as far as these murder type of cases? Were you always fascinated with the law, with crime? What got you interested? Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm I, I'm excited to chat with you. I followed along. So, um, you know, what really got me into it was work in St. Louis City. I became a prosecutor because I had a brother killed. Um, he was killed by a drunk driver and in Carolina visiting another brother who was in the military. So I knew very early on, I was pretty young, um, that I wanted to be a prosecutor or go into the law. For a little while, I thought I wanted to do things like go work at The Hague and do war crimes. And then um, I started working at um, the prosecutor's office in St. Louis, where there's no shortage of homicide. Uh, made that unit pretty quickly. And after that, I, I just was hooked. Um, I think working for victims, uh, giving the voices to people who can't, um, is just very uh, fulfilling. And I really think that working with families to try to get some measure of whatever we call justice is really what motivates me. So how many murder cases have you done? I don't, I, I'm, I'm well over a hundred. Um, over a hundred. Yeah. I, it, between very, between trial and bench trial and sentencings and then hearings, I, I'm well over a hundred. There are people in the St. Louis circuit attorney's office uh, who have handled well more than that. So sadly, when violent crime is, is rampant, especially homicides, um, you get a lot of experience handling those cases. How about uh, death penalty cases? How many of those have you done? Um, I don't know how many I have handled. I have tried. I have tried 15, 14. Um, most of those cases um, will, the person will eventually admit what they did and take some lesser sentence um, once death penalty is on the table, it's seldom, if ever, a talk about did they do it. It's really a fight over the punishment. Mm. Um, I don't think I've worked for a prosecutor who filed uh, the death penalty when it wasn't abundantly clear that the person was responsible. Uh, prosecutors take that very seriously. I've never worked for one who did it lately or did it maybe when they shouldn't have. So I've, I've been pretty fortunate. Right. Those have got to be the really heinous crimes with, as we learned in Chad Daybell's trial, the aggravating factors. So you, you've you seen a lot. I mean, you've seen a lot of evidence, probably a lot of autopsy photos, a lot of gruesome pictures. How, how what is that like? You know, I, I think that is... The hard part, I think you have to very, become very analytical. Um, you always care. Um, an old time prosecutor I worked with said, when you quit caring, it's time to quit, right? Um, you have to care, uh, but you it, you turn on a level of, you know, you just put aside the emotion, you focused on analysis and you get your head straight on, this is my purpose, this is my goal. Um, and then it becomes a question of, hey, what does that picture mean? What is that injury? How do we explain that? So it becomes very analytical. So how did a prosecutor in Missouri end up prosecuting a case in Idaho? Uh, it, you know, I think it's one of those situations where the stars aligned. Um, I had left the circuit attorney's office where I'd been at for over 20 years and for my family, I wanted more home time. I didn't want to give up, uh, however, prosecution. It's just I'm passionate about it. And so I started my own practice supporting prosecutors. And I had a couple of offices. I was helping handling their homicides or backlog. There's a huge backlog on cases around the country. 
And at that time, Rob Wood uh, was looking for help uh, moving his case forward. And he happened to reach out for but to Vera Causa Group and the NDAA. I had worked with people at Vera Causa Group and NDAA prior to. And he said, hey, is there anybody I can't find anybody in Idaho who's willing to sign on and do this case with us? He looked in Washington, he looked in Utah, and he you know, he looked sort of regionally, and nobody wanted and nobody with experience wanted to sign on for what was going to be a multi-year commitment. And I had just really started to build my effort. And so they recommended me. I interviewed with Rob and his whole team, uh, and he, they hired me. Wow. Okay. So do you think they didn't want to come on? You mentioned mentioned the multi year multi year commitment. Is that why? Because it was just such a it'd be such a lengthy case. Yeah. Anybody who has got experience handling homicides of this nature um, knows it. You're in for at least two or three years. And that was before COVID, right? Or did you come on right in the midst of COVID? I came on just after COVID. Okay. But before they were given permission, uh, either Fremont or Madison were given permission to convene a grand jury. Mm. So I was before they had the ability to kind of move the case forward, but just after things started to open up. What did you think when you first started to hear about the case? I don't know if you remember, did you get like an email with the facts? I'm sure you did a little bit of research. What Do you remember your in initial reaction to what you were hearing about this twisted, complicated case? Um, you know, my initial reaction was I couldn't believe it had happened in Idaho because that's not the picture you think of Idaho. I also um, was just absolutely impressed by the commitment of law enforcement from Rexburg and Rob Wood's team who had zero, I mean, Rob Wood's team really had no experience doing homicide, but they were just so absolutely committed to getting justice for the kids and Tammy that it, that, that was beyond impressive. Um, the commitment of law enforcement, all of them, and at that point, it was really Rob's team. Um, Lindsay hadn't yet, um, I don't know if she'd gotten the case back or she hadn't really yet gotten involved. Um, but that that piece was, um, it's to this day, one of the most impressive efforts of law enforcement and prosecutors I've seen. And for those that need a reminder, originally, um, there was a different prosecutor in Fremont County, Marsha Murdoch, who asked the attorney general to take the case from Fremont's perspective. So the AG took that part of the case. When Lindsay Blake was elected, she asked for the case back. So that's that explains why Lindsay Blake wasn't on it from the beginning. She simply was not in office, but offered to, to take the case back. So you come in with all of this experience and you know it's going to be a death penalty case. Are you doing things differently knowing it's death penalty? And at the time you have two death penalty, Lori and Chad, versus if it was a non-capital case as far as a, a, from a prosecutor's role? Realistically, no. Um, I think it probably felt different to people in the prosecution team. But realistically, any complicated homicide, you have to dot every I, cross every T, you can't take anything for granted. Um, and you really have to double and triple check your discovery. So for me, no, a lot of it was new to the rest of the team. So if there was a difference, the difference would be the amount of time we work together as a team to kind of double check Idaho law, make sure we're all coming from the same sort of perspective on what was needed. That was, that was probably the, the most difference. Um, but realistically for me, it was trying a complicated homicide the way it needed to be tried. And when you're sitting down at these meetings, going through all the evidence, all the witnesses, all the facts, then realizing you have to present all this to a jury in an easy to understand manner, but still prove your point. 
how, how do you, how do you put that all together? I mean, it, it, it just seems so like a huge task. Where do you start? You know, uh, the, the nice thing is Rob and Lindsay very early on committed to monthly. And then eventually it was weekly um, team meetings. And the case was divided up by topic, at least initially. Um, and so, because you can't, one person can't do everything. It's just not possible. Um, you can read everything, but you can't really be point on everything. So Rob and Lindsay agreed to the team meetings. We divided tasks up, usually by subject matter. Uh, and then we would report into each other. So it's it was a very... Um, focused, topic oriented. Um, and then once we got closer, it became very, all right, we need a cohesive theme, which is an integral part of trying any case. I don't care whether it's a drug case or a DWI to a capital murder case, you have to have a succinct way to convey it to the jury. And the team worked really hard to get a coherent theory uh, and then um, a distill it into a good theme. And we, they were successful. The whole team was successful in getting that done. And Lindsay opened with it. Um, and then Rob opened with it in the Chad case. And then Rob closed with it. And then we organized our evidence that way. So I think working as a team, coming up with a coherent theory, which means the story of the case, and distilling it into an understandable theme. And with the theme, money, power, sex. Money, power, sex. Okay, so as you're going through all this, was there ever a moment where you personally were like, oh, wow, this is the smoking gun. We we got them on this. That happened so many times to me. Um, and at some point, it, it just, there was, there was so much evidence. Um, we had to make strategic choices as a team. And Rob and Lindsay worked really hard to include everybody in that, um, especially on Lori's case. Um, and we, you know, candidly, some things we, we would be impressed with, and then we would run it by the law enforcement components because that was the other piece. We were meeting with them regularly and they weren't as impressed. There was almost a distillation process, if that makes sense. Right. I, I the, ha the hair of Lori on the duct tape, when we got that, I thought, wow. And then I took it to law enforcement. They're like, he's his mom. And they're like, but do you understand how important that is? Like, do you understand? Like her hair, her hair is in that duct tape. And they're like, yeah, but she's the mom. And I'm like, okay, so maybe it's not. So yeah, there were lots of moments like that for me. Um, and that's where doing that, you don't get tunnel vision. And I think journalists, you can't get tunnel vision about a situation you're covering, right? Right. Same thing. We can't get tunnel vision. So that was the a really um, invaluable part of this experience is working with law enforcement, working with my fellow prosecutors to to vet and revet and distill. Uh, and I, I was pretty blessed that they were all game and we all worked on that together and some things were more important to them. Some things were more important to the prosecutors, but it, that collaborative team approach is what really helped people kind of distill things in a way that was understandable. I remember that day in court when we heard for the first time that her hair was on that tape. Uh, that that was a, a big day. We had not heard that up until that point. And even though, of course, the mother might have the hair on the pajamas or whatever, it still, as you said, was on the tape. But I could get why law enforcement would say, well, yeah, but that's that's the mom. Yeah. Um, how do you work with witnesses who might be apprehensive or scared when you really, they know a lot and they can help your case, but I mean, they might be frightened or they might be ashamed of that they were that they knew these people. How, how, how do you strike that balance to get them to tell the truth, the full story uh, and 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 still respect you and respect the law and and be willing to show up and testify? It, you know, um, th that is a, something that we all prosecutors work for. That is not uncommon for people to be scared, to be embarrassed. Um, 
you know, what a rape victim has to talk about on the stand, most of us never would want to say to anyone, right? And it's just, and so you work with them, one, you work to meet them where they are. You work to put aside any personal judgment you might have about them. Um, and to really seek understanding and then emphasize that there's no such, they cannot mess anything up except if they lie. And so as long as they commit to you that they won't lie and that they'll tell the truth no matter who's asking, um, you begin, you work to develop them in a way that they can tell their truth um, in the best way they can. And so you set those ground rules. You meet them where they are. You don't judge them. You seek understanding rather than tell them what to say. And you emphasize and mean it over and over again. It's about the truth. That's all this is about. It's and are there are there days where you fully suspect we're going to call this person Tuesday and then things completely go a, 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 a turn on Monday and then you've got to reshuffle Tuesday and maybe you don't need to call this person because court gets out at 3.30, but your job's not done for the day. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's all the time. Yes, absolutely. And you sit down and you explain it to them and you regroup, but you have to have agility. You have to be able to kind of understand, you know, you may have three witnesses that say similar versions of something and you can tell that you're losing the jury. So you distill it to two or one. Yeah, no, you, you really have to focus on helping them. The witnesses tell the truth in the best way, but remembering it's about helping the jury understand your theory, uh, your belief in what happened. And at what point you mentioned losing the jury, at what point, particularly Fallow Daybell case, you probably could have gone for another three or four weeks. There was that much the evidence and witnesses. At what point do you realize, okay, we've done enough or maybe we should do more? How do you balance that just to be sure? You, you have to recognize that, and I, I, I talk to my husband about this all the time. I call him my normal person. He's my Joe jury. Yeah. Um, that normal people don't um, live in the world that sometimes prosecutors or law enforcement live in where we see bad things that people do to each other all the time. And so taking that step back and looking at it, making yourself look at it from a point of view of somebody who's normal, you know, and to help them, um, and realizing, you know what, we don't need six witnesses to talk about the hair on the duct tape. Mm. Um, one can talk about and get the evidence out and move on. Um, there was a lot of discussion, um, and I don't mean to make some trite, but there was a lot of discussion with the whole team of we can't bury the headlines. Mm. There may have, there, there, Doug Hart did the primary work on the iClouds for the team. Multiple officers, however, worked in that iCloud. Right. Right. But at some point, you will bury what is important if you have everybody talk about everything. And so you take that step back and you go, okay, I have three people who can say the same thing. Who does it best? Who is most articulate? Who is most succinct? Who is the person who can convey they authentically what this means. And then you pick that person and move on. Mm. Interesting. And, and Doug, Doug was for that case, you know, for both cases, multiple officers, it was an investigative tool. It was a powerful and source of evidence. Doug didn't cover a fraction of what he could have covered, right? right. Um, he didn't. And, and, and that's simply because at some point we have to say, we cannot bury the headline. And we just can't do some sort of evidence dump and hope the jury picks up on it. Right. So you sit back and if you have three that can say the same thing, you pick the best one and you move on. Yeah. Although as a reporter, I would have loved to hear more jailhouse calls, more, <laughs> more videos. We love that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But, but you're right. The jurors can be looking at their watches saying, okay, we're in week six here. Right. How long is this going to go? Um, I, I don't need to listen to, to, you know, phone sex through the jail. That's just right. 
Right. They don't need it. They don't. And, and by then they're, they're sick of it. They got it. They move on. They don't need to hear it again. Right. I would, I would imagine because Lori's case was different and that there was no defense when you're dealing with someone where there is a defense. And for instance, the question is raised about whether there's two stories in the house or not prosecutors then have to be on their feet to respond to that. And, and in this, in Chad's case, they did that with multiple other witnesses coming in and saying there were two stories. So I guess you really do have to be, especially during the defense portion of the case on your toes, ready to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, much of what the defense does is knowable. I mean, it, that's really an important piece is to take a step back and ask yourself as a prosecutor, all right, if I were defending this person, what would I do and anticipate it? One, that's to make sure you're doing the right thing for the right reason and then you don't have tunnel vision. But two, so that in the courtroom, if something like that happens, you have a plan for how to pivot. And so you limit how much is not knowable. Um, and then you make a strategic choice on how to plan for it. So I, I, I will be candid. One of the reasons I think Rob and Lindsay were so successful, because I, I do think they were very successful in smashing back uh, Pryor's defense, was they anticipated a lot of it. Mm. Right? They were ready. Right. Um, and they spent a lot of time um, assuring themselves of the quality of their own evidence by thinking, if I were in the other person's shoes, what would I do? Okay, now how do I combat that? So those are really important things. And I think they did a really nice job on anticipating that stuff. What do you think in Lori's case, you all did like phenomenally well on? Like, is there a highlight from that case that you're like, we really hit it when we did this? I I, I will tell you, I think the theme framed that evidence um, very early on. So I think getting that theme out early, starting the case focused that way, which is how that case started. Um, it was about the money with Brandon. It was about the power and control Lori and, and, and Chad had over even Melanie Boudreau and, and then Charles. Um, I think we that went really well because it really made that jury take a step back. And it's natural in a case where a parent kills a child for the, a juror to go, what sort of mother would do that? Why would a mother do that? Well, the first few words out of Lindsay Blake's mouth were why she did it. Right. And that, and that, and then the jurors, a couple of the jurors, I, we spoke to them and I watched them through you and, um, they were at first, a, a couple of them were like, mm, maybe, I don't, I don't know. But it immediately framed the evidence from a, why, why did Lori do it to, she did it for these right reasons. Do we believe that? So I think that that piece was integral to helping the jurors really set that out from the beginning. Was there ever talk about, I mean, religious aspects were definitely brought up throughout all of this about having money, power, sex, and religion? You know, I, I'm sure somewhere in there we did. Uh, there was a person assigned to run a lot of that down. Again, we divided things by topics. But for me, and I think we all reached that point at different places, so I can't say it was we were all in unison right away. There right. was a lot of vetting, as there should have been. Um, for me, religion was always a means to the end for Chad and Lori. Um, and I, what was really helpful is one of the prosecutors on the Elizabeth Smart case reached out to us, pretty me, pretty early on and said, remember, one of the ways that they handled the Elizabeth Smart case was he was religious when he wanted something from her. He didn't teach a doctrine because that's what he believed. It's when people weren't doing what they wanted or he wanted to accomplish something. And that's when he brought the Bible in. And um, that that is the way I had believed Chad and Lori were all along. Whether they believed it or not was irrelevant. It was they only really used religion 
when they wanted to achieve something, mm. it became yeah, it, a tool by which they got people to do things. By which they got the money, power, and sex. Ab- absolutely. So for me, it, this case, religion, I know everybody wanted it to be about the cult and that. And I'm like, no, that's white noise to me. Their beliefs changed in their circumstances. It, it, you know, the light and dark rating. I mean, there was one that was, and I think we used it both. Yeah, we used it in Lori. Um, I, I would be very surprised if they didn't use it in Chad. Um, where Lori is asking, she likes somebody, she wants some of them to kind of join their group. And so she reached out to Chad and said, hey, what what's the rating? And he gave it, I'm going to make the numbers up, but like he's 7.9 dark. And she goes, no, no, he's 3.4 light. And Chad's like, yeah, let's go with your numbers. Mm. Um, that is very typical for me of their exchange and reading all the stuff. Their religion was a way they achieved things, not something they embodied. Mm. Okay, so... What what would you have changed, if anything, if looking back now? You talked about the, the powerful theme that carried throughout. Is there anything that you maybe would have done differently? You know, I think we could have eased up on some of the iCloud text. Um, although, as the prosecutor, that was painful to ask Doug to maybe take some things out of his um, summary exhibit. Because um, there was such good stuff there. It was hard right. to... Hard to cut it, right? right. Um, I, I do think that we could have done a better job of organizing in the Lori side, and I think they they really modified it based on that. A better job of doing a coherent timeline. Mm-hmm. We had lots of different timelines. There were nine, I think I counted. But what we didn't do was pull it into one um, early on, and I think that would have been better. Um, I do think we could have spent some more time with Zulema. I could have I could have gone deeper with Zulema. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Um, I'm I'm kind of putting together a list um, for Rob and I um, to sort of lessons learned. Um, yeah. uh, there's lots of opportunities that we could have done uh, a better job, distilled it better argued it better. And it's interesting because I've interviewed jurors from both trials and at least one from each trial have told me Zulema was the witness that really got them. That really, the fact she had the journal entries and the drawings on the receipt and things like that. Um, And and you mentioned the timeline. That is one difference. Chad versus Lori's during closing arguments, Lindsay Blake displayed on an easel, a timeline right in front of the jury. So, um, as uh, as well as other things that were being projected on the screen. What did you think the day, like day one or day two in Lori's when she asked to leave because she didn't want to see the autopsy photos? I, I personally, um, I thought she's a, I felt like hypocrite. Um, uh, you know, those kids lived and died through that experience. Um, and so the idea that she wouldn't have to face that was just repulsive. Um, I, I do think that there's, it's one thing to be part of a conspiracy. There's another to have it held up to your face in, in the mirror. And that was being held up to her face and she had to look at it. Um, so to me, I felt like it was hypocrisy and cowardice. Were you surprised? I mean, have you seen other defendants in your years of experience do ask make these requests oh yeah i mean yeah um because uh us the ones especially the ones that are kind of coached by their defense attorneys they'll get emotional they get sad they and maybe they feel that way that you know i don't want to be too strident there is there should be a degree of remorse and pain in seeing that stuff but no i I, I was surprised a little bit because Lori likes the attention. Um, I was surprised that she would want to leave the courtroom, but um, it was pretty uh, cowardly and and I'm pretty blunt. I think it, it smacks of hypocrisy. Would you ever, when you weren't questioning a witness and sitting there at your table, just look at her and think, 
What are you thinking? I mean, I'm sure that everybody would love to know that, but did you ever just have a moment where you try to figure her out? Um, I would look at her and I would wonder what she was thinking. Um, I, I, in the courtroom, you don't have a lot of time to delve deeply right. on that sort of stuff. Um, you have to really focus, but no, absolutely. There were multiple times, um, you know, like, you know, when Colby's testifying, you know, I, as a mom, I don't know that I could put my child through that. I, I know I couldn't put my child through that. So there, during that time, um, the other piece, there was another time when we were showing pictures of Tylee with her, that necklace and her Instagram picture. My daughter had, was the same age as Tylee during that trial. And so I looked over at her and I, you know, and my, my daughter's amazing and I'm very blessed, but she can get a little lippy, right? Um, she, she earns that well. Um, I, I, of course it's her father's side, not mine. Of course. But, right. Right. Um, she can't possibly be lippy being my child, no. but, um, uh, I, I do remember sitting there when some of the pictures of Tylee with Brandon, because Brandon was the way we got those pictures in, in the day, in, in the Lori side, looking over at her, like, how, how could you do that? Like, does that make sense? Uh, like yeah. I can't even what that child went through, what JJ went through at times you just, you know, you had to get very analytical, you put it aside. But I can remember when I was questioning Brandon and I looked over at her and she just looked, she just looked so self-absorbed. So yeah, there were times Probably didn't even think about it till you asked. So maybe good question. Um, but uh, yeah, I I I do remember a few times because I had I had teens during this trial um, who were in high school couldn't process how she could have let herself get there. Yeah. What was your What was your area, Rachel, that you focused on? My area was sort of twofold. It was the Brandon Zulema sort of the people in the um uh the people that were sort of peripheral to Chad and Lori but sort of part of the group mm -hmm. and then the iCloud and the um uh some of the the fingerprints okay so did you review all of the iCloud I reviewed all of the iCloud um I reviewed um I, there's a wonderful tool and I think we showed it in Lori's case we physically showed the jury cell bright. Um, that tool is an amazing tool. You can literally word search um, and you can search um, through those texts using cell bright by date. Um, you can also search other areas of the cloud, you know, like um, the deleted, the uh, trash, the um you know, geolocation data. So Celebrate was a, a powerful tool. Um, but I also relied, I mean, Doug Hart did an amazing job. Um, but one of the things that we worked closely together with is helping him put his findings into sort of categories that matched the categories that the team, that the investigative team used and that the prosecutors were conveying. So his eye clouds, they were in sort of buckets. Is it, was it, a you know, was it about money? Was it a power about sex? Was it about a power or manipulation? Um, religion is a manipulation tool. So Doug's exhibit, Doug spent hundreds of hours. I spent a lot of time with him helping to refine, refine, refine. Mm. Was there anything that you can recall just off the top of your head that didn't make it in the trial that our viewers might find interesting or that you found interesting that, well, that really doesn't add to the case, but it's an interesting side note. You know, I'll have to think about, I, there were apps. I know there were right now. I can't think of them. Yeah. Um, and, and there were some that we went back and forth on and like, and, and took to Lindsay, took to Rob, took to Spencer, Tanya, um, you know, and they'd be like, and some people are like, that's oh, duplicative. You've gone over this three times. And, and um, you know, we need to shorten it. We need to shorten it. So, yeah, there was a lot 
<laughs> cut out yeah. um, even before Judge Boyce got his hands on it. So I see. What did you think when the death penalty for Lori was taken off the table less than a month before trial? Extreme frustration. Um, I, you know, I am not, I, I've done death penalty cases. I believe it, it for some crimes, it's an appropriate punishment, sometimes the only appropriate punishment um, and most fitting for people who won't accept responsibility um, and who, you know, make people's lives hell even after their crimes have occurred. Um, and so I was extremely frustrated because I I really believe that a jury, once they got past the, could a mom do this to some, their child, um, would have found the death penalty. In the end, it does make appeals a lot easier. Um, it won't reach the same level of scrutiny um, and with Lori's various actions, probably make a cleaner long-term outcome for the case. But personally, I was frustrated because I, I believe she deserved the death penalty and it, and, um, and I respect the court and I understand where he's coming from, but I, I was very disappointed. And did you have the same feeling when the cases were severed? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then same feeling, but to a lesser degree, because I, I did understand it on the change of venue. Right, right. What about cameras in the court? You know, I, I go back and forth on that. Um, I, cameras in the courtroom make it way harder on the prosecution. They just do. Um, I do believe, however, that the system needs to be transparent. I, I think that we need to do what we can to show people how the system works in reality, not in, you know, some novel or some true crime show. Um, but uh, I, per, I having tried cases both without that are complicated without cameras and tried them with, it is a lot easier on the state and the defense when cameras are in there. Yeah. So tell me about um, the length of of time. Is this the longest trial you've you've prosecuted? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And what was that like mentally, physically, being far from home in Idaho for weeks on end, going through this daily? Um, I you get very focused. Um, you just really focus on. There's not a lot of downtime. There's not a lot of time to think about other things. Um, and you really focus on what is important um, in that moment. And I'm really blessed. I have an exceptionally supportive family. Um, I have a husband who supports me and is proud of me. So I didn't have some pressures that others have, which is, where are you? When are you coming home? Because he knew how important it was. And both my kids and my husband um, it was extremely important to them that those kids and Tammy got justice. Um, I think you, you know, your family knows when you're going through something like this. And for them, it was extremely important that the right outcome happened. So I was pretty fortunate. I was able to focus. I was able to kind of keep perspective on the case, knowing that my family was going to be okay and that they had my back. They also came out a couple times, um, and so they were able to see the, I think it helped. They got to see the courthouse. They got to see the courtroom. They got to see where I was working and then see where I was staying. Um, so they knew where I was. Oh, yeah. That's great that they could come and visit. Did they actually come to the trial on a day? Or No, no, I, I, I didn't want that. Um, I just didn't know what reporters would do in that. Um, right. And not you per se, but I just didn't know what some others would do. Um, right. Yeah, and both my kids, my my daughter probably would have loved to. My son is very analytical, so he probably wouldn't have cared right. to come to the trial at all. Um, and I don't think my husband would because my husband is is very, um, he, he, he can't process something like this. Right. So the day comes for you to, for the prosecution to wrap up turn it over to the defense. Were you expecting a defense from Lori? I mean, Jim Archibald had kind of hinted at previous hearings that 
They might not have much, even with witnesses. And it, uh, but when death penalty was on the table, he said they would have some mitigation witnesses. But then when it was taken off, w- were you all still preparing for some sort of defense and also for Lori to testify? We we were. We were. We had a game plan. Um, and there was a plan on how to handle Lori's cross. And there was a plan on how to handle the defense. Um, and it was very much we had to be prepared for contingencies. And it's a, it's, you, you're taught it in law school. Now I teach it. Um, It's sort of, if they say this, then here's how we respond. And you just brainstorm it. It's point counterpoint. Um, And so we were ready. Um, I was surprised that they, they did as little as they did. Um, But in the end, um, that was their client's wishes. And that, that that is her right so um and they listen to her and that's the right to defend yourself how you want to so so were you prepared to cross-examine her had she taken the stand i i think the decision had been that Lindsay was going to cross-examine her okay um we there was there was a you know some outlines and some points and people were ready but i think the thought was Lindsay. I don't know that we've made a final decision, but that's certainly where I was. I I figured Lindsay would do the cross of glory. If if you were to have done it, what, or or even if right now, if you could, well, first of all, would you want to ask her anything at this point today? Would I want to ask? Oh, um, no, I, you know, there's always, of course, intellectual curiosity. curiosity. Right. Um, how could you do that to Alex? Um what did you do with Alex? Um, that sort of thing, um, the puzzle, but from a sort of perception point of view or sort of an emotion point of view, no. Um, she's gotten as much attention as she deserves. Um, I think she just needs to go away and stay yeah. away. Right. Well, we have another trial in Arizona coming up. Yeah. So she'll get, go there? she'll get more. I'm sorry, I'm going to contribute to that, but um, <laughs> maybe after that. She'll, yeah. She'll yeah. Uh, go away. So, okay. The time comes, they don't have a, def- they don't have a defense. She's not going to testify closing uh, arguments. Jury goes, what is that? Sometimes hour, sometimes two, sometimes day, sometimes several days like for a prosecutor when you're waiting on the jury, do you have like a ritual that you do? W- w- what's that time? Like, um, I, I, First of all, that time like is that is both a relief and the most um, anxious ridden time you could have. Um, I am a person of faith. I always pray. Um, I also um, put um, I, t- I take time to put my stuff away. Um, and then my old office, we would we would either play um I would play poker with people with paper clips. I didn't do that with Lori because um, there were, I don't think there were many poker players around. <laughs> yeah. um, but you got to have something to do. Right. So I typically will sit and talk to the team. I will often candidly pull up another case and start working it because I need a distraction. Mm. Um, so I have a, I put things away. I absolutely always pray. And then I, um, I, if somebody's around to play poker, I'll play paper club poker with them. So. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Then with her, the jury had dinner brought in, but then they went home to sleep. Did you sleep that night? I don't remember. Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. I had um, a couple of the colleagues and I um, did have dinner together that night. Um, I was in an Airbnb with one of my colleagues. We shared um an Airbnb the whole time, Tanya Rawlings and I. So I know we, and her husband was there. So um, we, we were together that night and a couple of us before that had dinner. So. Do you recall the next day? It was a Friday. Jury seemed to like Fridays yeah. uh, that when you got the notification that a verdict had been reached. Um, yes, I do. We were, I was with some members of the team um, in an area that we had in that courthouse and we got the verdict. Um, we all started talking, making sure that um, Kay and Larry knew 
um, that we had gotten to Tammy's sister to make sure that they all knew. And then we all just started getting to the courtroom. And what is that moment like when it's guilty across the board? That was, that was great for me. It was, you know, and I usually will take notes simply so I have someplace to focus. Um, and so the, I, it was relief when the first one came out and then what really knew for me, when I really knew that we had done the best job for that count with Lori and Tammy was always our toughest count. Hmm. Um, and when we got guilty on that, I'm like, okay, we're okay. Hmm. Um, um, because that was the one justice for Tammy for with Lori's role in that, um, was our, to me the toughest count. And when we had that, I knew we had done our job well. And that was for conspiracy to commit her murder, not actual first degree on her, but conspiracy. Right. right. And that night, I imagine there was a, a, a nicer dinner or a nicer uh, sigh of relief. There was a much, there was a big sigh of relief. I think there's also your adrenaline starts to leave your body. You're pretty tired, right? Yeah. Um, there was a get together with um, some, the law enforcement side of the team and the, um, other, you know, the uh, other prosecutors, we had a get together, we got to talk to Kay and Larry and, um, and, you know, some family members. And then I went to bed early. <laughs> right. Bed. You finally got to go home. Yeah. So yeah. Well, not for a couple of days, but yeah. Right. So Rachel, a lot of people have wondered why you didn't stay on through Chad's case. What can you tell us about that? You know, I think there's lots of reasons, but I think probably the but the biggest reason was I Fremont that this was a joint prosecution between Fremont and Madison. And I was hired by Madison and the new team, Lindsay had a team she wanted to use and a direction she wanted to go. And that, that didn't necessarily have to include me. Mm -hmm. So it was the right decision for me on a personal level. Um, and I had done what Rob hired me to do. I felt like we had I had worked really hard and got and been part of a small part of a team that was committed to justice and that Lindsay had a team that she wanted to use to go forward. Right. And, and did that you, worked. Did you watch Chad's case at all? I watched pieces. Um I you know I you know I have a full docket. I am helping prosecutors on multiple murders. So when I could, I made sure I tried to clear my calendar for um, the defense medical examiner, because that was just an intellectually interesting one for me. Um, I watched Ray Hermosito, because that sets the tone. Um, and then I watched where I could, um, other things. Anything stick out to you that was maybe different about Chad's versus Lori's, other uh, than they had a defense? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, James. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they had a defense. I do think and I, it, you know, um, I think Pryor did what he could. There was a long way to go for Chad to overcome two children dead and buried on his property, the same place where his wife died. That was, he had a long way to come back from on that. Um, I think Pryor did what he could with it. Um, that's, a, that's a hole for a criminal defendant to get out of that's going to be very difficult. So, um, I think the difference is he put up a defense, but he also picked the right areas to go after. Um, I, I suspect that might not be popular because I know he wasn't particularly popular, but he hired a credible expert um, to go after the holes in the state or the not holes, but the weaknesses in the state's case. Um, he attempted to bring in a couple of people that maybe didn't pan out. But he went in the right directions. Um, and the the hard part for John Pryor was that the prosecution team, Lindsay and Rob, were ready for him. Right. Did you watch when Chad's children took the stand? No, I went back and looked at them later. Um, what did you think about that? Um, I thought, what parent puts their child in that position? Right. Um, to me, their testimony, their obviously coached rehearsed effort to get him out of trouble um really typified who chad Dave was he used those kids even 
on the issue of their own mother's death to try to put himself forward and get himself out of trouble. And I, I think their testimony showed that. Mm. Were you surprised he got the death penalty? No. Mm. I mean, I think if you've got it, that was in jury selection. If a jury can consider the death penalty, and that's the hard part is jury selection in those cases. If a jury can really consider the death penalty on someone, then Chad T Daybell fits the bill. What do you think you learned from all of this? I know that's a big question, but looking yeah. back at this big three, four, five year ordeal, what did you learn? Oh, so much. I, I One of my biggest takeaway is the absolute importance of teamwork. Um, the absolute importance of sort of shared values and the success of the prosecution team and the success of law enforcement to do the right thing by the kids, by Tammy, for the right reasons really reflected um, both in the, the legal work and the law enforcement investigative work. So it just reiterated and emphasized how much um, law, uh, teamwork and focus on doing the right thing for the right reason is just paramount. How does this case stack up or, or compare, I guess I should say, against your others? You hate to do that in a way, but when you're looking back over the course of your career, does this one, you know, will this one always be one that you're like, oh, that one time... Yeah, this one will. Um, you know, I've had very complex cases before. <laughs> um, I've had cases with a lot of paper, but this had sort of everything in it. The other piece was <laughs> if any twist or turn could happen, it happened in this case. The minute we thought we knew and the minute we thought we found something else, something else happened, some other twist or turn or motion or something would happen. So that it's going to stand out for all of those things. Pretty much it's, it's one of those cases that will always sort of stick out. Um, even amongst the complex, it's just got every twist or turn you can imagine. Um, speaking of the twists and the turns, you have a theory about Alex? Oh, I absolutely have a theory about Alex. I, um, Alex, I, I I, I know Maricopa worked hard. I know they did a good job. I still would love to know what he was buying on his trips to Central America. I still want to, I would love to run some of that stuff down. But with his passage, it became one of those things we just didn't need to do. Um, I, I don't believe he died from natural causes. I know that's the ruling and couldn't say it on the stand, but I don't believe it was natural causes. It may have been self-inflicted, but I don't believe that, uh, that he was died naturally. Um, um, and there's no question in my mind. He was the, he was the hands, um, at least some of the hands that, that ended three lives. Do you think him and Chad both killed Tammy? I do. Both of them. I think the physical evidence cooperates that. Yeah. I think bruising and, the absence, the, the 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 piece that really always resonated with me and other members of the team, we talked about it a lot. The absence of other injuries. She was she she was a healthy woman. She would have fought back. They needed a way to immobilize her. One person, there would have been more marks. There would have been more injuries. There would have been more. Um, if only one person was involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we might be seeing more of you in Idaho. Yeah. And I, I know you probably can't talk much about it, but for those people that are familiar with the Jeremy Best case, can you talk about your involvement at all with that case? No, I think it's a public record that I am in Pro Hoc Vice, um, assisting Bailey Smith, um, an a really wicked smart prosecutor down in Teton. Um, Again, I, I I will tell you, um, Idaho has some amazingly committed, dedicated public servants, and I'm I'm lucky I'm on that team. Yeah. Well, Rachel, thank you for your work in um, 
this case, the Daybell case, and that one as well. Um, is there anything I should have asked you? Anything that you want to add? No, I, I just, I, I hope the public, especially the people in Idaho, know how fortunate they were to have the investigative team that they had on this case and to have the prosecution teams that they had on this case. They, those people didn't, they dedicated so much of their personal lives and so much of themselves to justice for TME, JJ, and Tylee, I just think it's, it cannot be overstated how blessed the people of Idaho are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rachel Smith. You can check out, do you have a website, Rachel? I do. It's uh, smithlawconsulting.com. Okay. And you can uh, read about the other, other cases. And as I mentioned, we might be seeing more of her in, in upcoming cases. Nice chatting with you, Rachel. Thank you. With you. Thanks.